I remember my high school biology teacher saying that she, personally, was biologically unsuccessful because she never had children. I continued to wonder whether an organism's biological success, its fitness, is measured simply by whether or not it manages to reproduce and pass on its genes. Look at these ants scrambling to save the eggs that I have exposed. These are worker ants and they are infertile, so they will never reproduce. So what's going on here? Why are they working so hard? Can cooperation play a role in an organism's fitness? What's really changed since I was a graduate student, um, and, and kind of the Darwinian view, although, although you can fi find in Darwin an a discussion of cooperation, is this importance of cooperation. That is, um, uh, when I was a graduate student, and I think the common view in, in the public eye is nature, red and tooth and claw, you know, everything's competitive, every organism is trying to get ahead. Um, while that's true, often the road to getting ahead is by forming alliances with others and cooperating. We're all familiar with the fact that if we form alliances with others, we can do more than going it alone. So there's a common theme here of cooperation and conflict, and when I speak about evolution to high school students, I, um, I try to impress upon them that cooperative interactions and conflictual interactions exist on all levels in the hierarchy of life. And the, kinds of games that they play in their schoolyard um, are also played among these different units in, in uh, life. That is among genes, among cells, and many human diseases are just the lack of cooperation, the uh, reversal from the cooperative state, like cancer is a perfect example of a disease, which is just um, the loss of these cooperative interactions. Cells start going their own way, they start over dividing, producing tumors, and so the the checks and balances that normally exist on cells in our bodies to make them cooperate are, are lost in, in these cancerous cells. Just as cells in a multicellular organism cooperate, these worker ants are cooperating with one another, and in so doing, they are helping the queen, and they are helping the colony itself. Cooperation is defined as a behavior that, that helps the group, but, but harms the individual. So if I take a risk and, and share something with you, if I have a piece of food and I share it with you, I'm gonna lose that energy, that caloric value in that food, and it's gonna benefit you and the rest of the group. Um, so cooperation is defined as a behavior that does exactly what we need, that is it transfers fitness from the level of the individual to the level of the group. It's a similar phenomenon where you have the association of individuals in social groups and that we can talk about selection happening at the level of the social group. So in addition to natural selection working at the level of the individual organism, it can also work at the level of the group. This is called group selection. The wasps in this nest may have an inheritable characteristic which makes them, as a group, fitter than the wasps in another nest. And so then is when we start talking about selection happening at the level of the groups, which has been a controversial idea in evolutionary biology. But I think that times are changing and that we need to consider selection at the level of the groups if we are to understand the history of life. These hyenas hunt and eat in packs. 
a vivid example of cooperation among unrelated individuals of the same species. Of course, we are another great example. There's cooperation all the time in our species. There's also cooperation between species. Here are some ants that I photographed in Colorado tending their herd of aphids. In exchange for this care, the aphids give the ants a nutritious nectar. There, there it is. This is an example of symbiosis. Cows cannot digest grass without the help of certain bacteria and other microorganisms that live in their stomachs. Symbiosis is the living together of more than one species throughout the life history in physical contact, throughout the life history of at least one of them. And yes, the more we study it, the more we realize that all organisms that you can see with the unaided eye are living in symbiosis with others. You have a symbiotic relationship with your eyelash mites and of course your underarm bacteria, your between the toes bacteria and so on. Yeah, one of the projects I'm kind of um dreaming about getting started and this would be a really huge global collaborative thing was to do sort of like a, a full biodiversity study and catalogue of all the things that live in and on the human body. So there's all sorts of you know amazing critters and they do all sorts of things, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them ugly um, and some of them you know completely just passive and neutral but it would, it would be a really good project to do. Yeah, sort of a, a, human, a human zoo project, yeah. Whether mutually beneficial, parasitic, or somewhere in between, all of these symbiotic relationships tie species together in a web, a web of interactions between living things. Living things also interact constantly with non-living things. Minerals and chemicals, like oxygen and water, flow through our bodies. I think it's really good if we think of ourselves as being part of a, a bigger fabric and, 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 a, and a system and that we have to respect that system or it'll actually um, it'll, it'll become unpleasant for us. Scientists explore the idea that the total system of the living and the non-living on Earth is self-regulated. This idea, called the Gaia hypothesis, was developed in the early 1970s by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. But what is Gaia then? It's the system of atmosphere, soil, and other aspects of the surface of the earth that is um, physiologically modulated. What does that mean? It means that the temperature is maintained, that the, the chemical composition it's a very reactive chemical composition, is actively maintained by the sum of the organisms on the surface of the earth. Of course, not just the organisms, the organisms and their interaction with wind and rocks and all of the f other uh, more physical components of the earth. So the biosphere, which is all of life on earth and the earth itself, the minerals, the water, the oxygen, the nitrogen, is a self-regulating system. This system came about through nearly four billion years of evolution. So next, we'll take a look at those four billion years and explore the history of life.